Luisa, you describe yourself as a freedom for information activist. You are also a campaign coordinator at Hagenstadt, Ask the, the State, I guess, in German, a project of the Open Knowledge Foundation Germany. Uh, you use freedom of information or FOIA to conduct investigation, campaign and litigation to ensure more transparency. You also specialize in European border control policies, EU lobbying and EU climate policies. Jelena, you're a freelance journalist publishing on a variety of subjects, mainly on the environment, migration, and in English, French, and Croatian, often with a cross-border lens. You have been collaborating with Arena for Journalism in Europe as the program curator for Data Harvest, the European Investigative Journalist Journalism Conference, and formerly as coordinator, and now as the editor of the Arena Climate Network. So let's start. Um, why did you both decide to investigate on water and its quality in Europe? And what were the major challenges with your investigation? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting us. Uh, and also, I want to preface um, this whole conversation by saying that Luisa and I don't have like a roadmap as to like who is going to answer what. So we're going to complete each other. Um, and cut off each other sentences, hopefully more complete each other sentences. But um, I can start um, because the idea is actually, the idea came from, from something that was discussed with an organization I collaborate with, uh, Arena for Journalism in Europe, that was mentioned earlier. Um, and um, Arena has this idea of basically launching networks of journalists that work on, um, that work on specific topics. So for instance, it had housing network, it had a climate network, and then last year it launched food and water network. And during that preparation, we were looking into different topics that had been uh, underreported in Europe. Um, and food and water network being the network that has to do anything like that sort of connects journalists that work on agriculture, you know, water scarcity, pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we thought that the 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 like the stories on water scarcity have become more prominent, but the water pollution had been something that maybe uh, was less reported on at this European level. Um, and that coincided with a time where uh, the organization or rather the program called Bertha uh, Challenge um, published its annual call for applications and Bertha Challenge actually connects activists and journalists to work on specific topics together. So sometimes it's in pairs, but basically it's a cohort of activists and journalists working on one topic per year and topic of 2022 was water. Um, and so at, the, at that point, Luisa and I, I think, had seen each other like this on the on the screen because uh, we have been attended events during Corona uh, that took place online, uh, but our organizations had been collaborating. Um, and so we thought, OK, it would actually be interesting to see what's the situation with um, water pollution. And we specifically decided to work on water pollution by agriculture, so from agriculture sources. Um, and to do that at the European level, sort of to see like what happens at the at the at the EU level, um, where and in which way um, the water policies are made and how, etc. And we thought that combination of having Luisa as a as a freedom of information activist, so somebody who actually works. Um, in order, I mean, she can talk more about her work herself, but like having this um, aspect of somebody who's really trying to to um, influence the organizations, influence the institutions to become more transparent. And then uh, myself, who comes from an organization that has a cross-border perspective and, and very much works at this European level, um, could be interesting. And we got the fellowship. And then we spent the whole last year basically uh, looking into, um, well, different aspects of, of water pollution. Yeah, and just to add, um, I mean, my so my core work is freedom of information. And then I work a lot with um, journalists such as Yelena in this case, or um, also other members of civil society. So sometimes it's 
um, NGOs or activist groups or lawyers um, and the way we work um, with freedom of information is uh, very based on this idea of um, the right to information as an instrumental right so a right that helps advance the works of others so it, it really made a lot of sense for us in practical terms to um, do this sort of collaborative um, project with Yelena as journalist and me as an FOI activist um, and to work as a pair. Um, and then specifically um, on the topic of water and agricultural um, pollution, um, it, it was also very appealing, um, especially at first, because um, I think especially at the outset and like during the, like while we were conceiving the investigation and also even during the first months, um, it, we thought actually that this would be um, sort of a transparency problem to solve. Um, so our idea was that, you know, access to information was a big block um, in understanding and therefore solving the problem. Um, so it, it felt like a very logical um, approach for freedom of information to come into a, a project like this. This is something that we kind of um, found that it, it wasn't exactly like this. So transparency actually was not as much of an issue um, as we had initially thought, um, or at least transparency in the way that we had thought about it. But we will talk about challenges and surprising things a bit later on. Um, yeah, but like that's, I guess, what drove me and my organization to the project initially. It was just um, very tempting for a transparency activist to work on a project like this. Okay, thank you. There are uh, five parts of your investigation and we're going to post, I think, the, uh, the, the links in the chat with the, the five um, uh, parts of your work. Um, one question uh, for, for one aspect of your investigations uh, for both of you is reading your investigation. One can have the impression, one has the impression that at least in some regions, some, some areas, People in Europe are poisoning themselves every time they drink tap water or eat fruits and vegetables from industrial farming in particular. So what is the situation today and the real dangers for health? And how long, um, as, far, as far as your investigation has, has, has shown, uh, these have those dangers been known by governments and health authorities in, each, in, in most countries and in Europe as well? So it's for both of you. <laughs> I can I can start. Yeah. So um, I think we, we definitely did. Um, we, we went to different places, and in in some places, um, people weren't able to drink their tap water, or would do that, um, but with the knowledge that there is potentially a, a, like a substantial health hazard um, coming from out of their taps. So um, it's very hard to. <laughs> Uh, the thing with this investigation, I think this is like at, at the beginning, as Luisa said, we had this idea, it's going to be a transparency issue. So we will need documents and then we're going to actually figure out that there are, you know, there's an issue with pollution from pesticides or nitrates. Um, and then when we actually started like reading more and like going to different places, talking to the experts, we realized that the, it, it wasn't as simple. So in, in some ways um, there, I mean, there are different transparency issues depending on the countries, um, even at the, at the EU level. Um, but what personally I, I, I wasn't aware um, was an issue at, at the beginning is the fact that we actually don't really a, we often don't know what sort of, um, what is actually present in our drinking water or in our waterways. Um, so we didn't specifically work on, on, on tap water and drinking water. We, we also looked into that aspect uh, in certain countries, but like even when we talk about our waterways and you know in, about the, the substances that are present there and that very much influence biodiversity and the living organisms, um, in, in lakes, rivers, etc. Um, we often don't know actually 
to what extent the substances there are are hazardous and in which ways. Um, and that is, we have an idea with certain substances, um, but then there is this whole story of thresholds and you know what happens up to a certain threshold, uh, what happens afterwards, what happens with bioaccumulation, does anything happen with bioaccumulation? So in some ways, I think, um, you know, we hope to get a much clearer answer from scientists in, in many, in many cases. And the science does have some answers, but like very often we would get like very, very cautious um, answers to very simple questions. So it would be like, we think this is the case, or we think this would be the thresholds, but like, of course we don't have, you know, like it's a substance that's been around for the past 10 years. Um, it's not uh, like, you know, it, it's still being put out in the market. Uh, we think it's not poisonous or like harmful for people, but actually like, we don't know what happens in like in 50 years. And I think like, there's, um, there are a lot of questions that like, we just couldn't answer um, and like, because we don't know and we are not scientists and that was very frustrating actually because we you know sometimes you want scientists to tell you like this is what will happen and they would be like we think that this might happen if this other thing happens and that was basically the the gist of pretty much uh pretty much every every case study that's uh, that we worked on um when it comes to the the countries and and what they know or what they don't know i don't think there is like a a large conspiracy um, going on uh, between the european countries um, but what I think is happening is that the um, you do have countries that don't actually um, measure all the substances that they, they might measure, or you, for instance, don't have um, the same, um, you wouldn't necessarily have like the same, um, let's say, like set of criteria uh, for, I don't know, like to measure that uh, something is a, uh, something is hazardous for um, a habitat in a particular lake. So for instance, I think in some ways there are countries that measure many more substances. And I think in some ways, um, you, you know, in certain countries you might have this more, more research is being done, uh, more policies are put into place um, or simply because, you know, more things are measured, you might actually have the feeling that those countries are uh, firing worse than the others, well, that might not necessarily be the quotes. So um, the case, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so what I'm trying to say by this, and this was, I think, the most cumbersome part of the research for me, um, is we just don't have um, a good comparable data for all the substances that we might want to analyze. Um, which was which was big issue. So I don't think there's a straightforward answer to you know what countries know, uh, what the countries have been trying to do about that. Um, one thing that I can say is that many people said about the European legislation is that um, theoretically is very good, so it looks good on paper, uh, but it's very hard to reinforce it. I would just quickly add that also um, I got the feeling from, I mean, the, the research that we did, but also just the conversations we had with people in the different countries that the level of awareness, um, I mean, you have the, the population that's most affected by the issues and everyone who's affected knows about it and is trying to organize about it and it's in conversations with local authorities. So like there is always in the most affected areas quite a lot of information about what's going on and how this information is collected and the data is collected as Yelena mentions really varies so sometimes it's the actual citizens getting involved in the measurements themselves sometimes it's universities sometimes it's local authorities so that really varies a lot but basically in these areas there is quite a lot of awareness I think whether this is treated as um, an actual problem and it's talked about and so on um, depends quite a lot or at least in the way that we saw it on how um, active and organized civil society is in those areas and there we saw um, really um, different approaches and different levels of awareness as for example in France where 
um, there's a strong civil society that's very organized and very active and very loud, which is fabulous. Um, and a lot of people in France know about this very localized problem in the region of Brittany. And then you have maybe the opposite in Spain where civil society is very scarce and very little organized, um, which is basically just regular citizens doing little things on their own free time. And this problem is therefore very um, sort of seldom talked about and is very unknown for the rest of Spain, for instance. And we kept having the I, I am Spanish myself, and when we started doing this research and when we were, were picking the regions um, in Spain, for instance, uh, uh, where we could work and so on, um, we kept having conversations with people and everyone I told about um, the problem in Aragon and the fact that some people don't have uh, clean drinking uh, water from the tap in that region were very surprised and they couldn't believe that this had become so much of a problem. So their like the level of awareness clearly is very different as in other regions. Um, and you can see how in a way that responds to just the, the amount of sort of activism there is in the area and then um, how this impacts sort of campaigning and awareness raising. So basically what you're saying is the very important or strategic role of civil society in that on that matter in that matter. To me, it's really crucial. Um, and I, I mean, I, I had great, great admiration to sort of everyone we spoke about, we spoke to um to the course of this project um, that were working on it and they were all dealing with the problem themselves so they were all just living in these regions that have this big pollution problems and at the same time they were the ones doing the activism around it um which i i think requires a lot of drive and it's very very impressive um but you can really see i mean it's also sort of cultural and political differences between different european states um, and it really varies a lot, but I do think that just having organized civil society um, sort of taking the lead on these problems and just putting the information out there and so on is really, really crucial. Um, and I mean, again, the case of Spain is really, really important because um, it was, for instance, civil society doing measurements themselves. Um, and going to the water sources and doing this little tests that they had gotten through an NGO. And it, again, like this is people who are teachers on a day <laughs> during the main job. Um, and when they're done with their job, they go and measure water and campaign around it. So um, that really makes a difference. And it's, it is a crucial aspect of the problem, I think. So during your investigation, um, did you did you find many or specific obstacles in either uh, accessing people or places or finding data? And did, did you discover something that maybe you didn't expect? Huh? Um, I can start with this one um, because it's about obstacles and data. Um, no, I think actually, like the course of the investigation was a surprising one when it comes to obstacles and opacity and transparency. Um, I think um, at the outset, the idea that we had or sort of expectation that we had was that actually the data that we wanted to work with existed, but it wouldn't be disclosed or we would have issues with obtaining this data. And actually that sort of reality flipped our vision um, because as Jelena was mentioning, I think the main obstacle is the collection of data in itself and how measurements are not consistent. They're not um, the same in every country, in every region. Um, so it's really non-comparable data, which makes it quite difficult to work with and to properly scrutinize the problem and to really have a grasp of what is going on at a European scale, uh, but even at a national scale. So the, the measuring, for example, that is done in different regions within a country varies um, in terms of what is measured, how often, um, how this data is transmitted and so on. So it's 
it's quite difficult to work with that sort of um, patchy information. Um, at the same time, the information um, that's not measurements and data in itself, but just the information around the issue that is collected and is exist and that does exist, um, was actually, in my opinion, released with uh, more ease than we would have had expected. Um, and it really was quite funny in the process of planning the investigation that, I mean, I am used to sort of planning a lot of time for appeals and for refusals and things like this, because I do come across them quite often. Um, and in this case, we really managed to obtain a lot of um, very interesting and relevant documents. And as a matter of fact, an actual overwhelming amount of documents um, through just FOI requests and sort of the, the investigative process. So actually that was um, quite surprising in itself. So the information that does exist, um, we were able to obtain and we actually created um, this data set that is now available to everyone and it has 12,000 documents in it. Um, and this is information held by EU institutions, um, so mainly the European Commission, um, around sort of the EU water framework and everything around it. Um, so yeah, I, I think the fact that it contains 12,000 documents is already sort of credit to um, what we were able to obtain, and that's great news. Um, in sort of the flip side to it, and I was mentioning at the start that we thought we were going into this investigation thinking this is going to be, in essence, a transparency problem. Um, and I think what we found in the end um, was that it's not so much a matter of transparency, although there is a nuance to this, which I can explain, um, but it's more a matter of accountability. So actually the people on the ground, and as I mentioned, the people who are most affected and the local citizens and the local governments and everyone that's most affected by the issue and sometimes in some countries, even like the national population is aware of what is going on, has a pretty clear idea of um, why it's happening. Um, so the information is there in a way, and sometimes they've litigated around it, they campaign around it. So transparency is not so much the issue. Um, the, the big obstacle we always come around is how do we solve this? So why, you know, we have this great legal fight, uh, legal framework um, and yet it's not working so what is broken in the middle and why is it not enforced and when it's not enforced why um, is there no remedy that's the main question so it's more of an accountability problem than a transparency one um, and just the one caveat that I would mention when it comes to access to information um, by the people who are most affected by the problem um, our sort of constant impression speaking to people was that um, actually the, there was a lot of access to information about what was going on at a regional and even at a national level. I think the most inscrutable part of the process, which is really interesting, is the EU level um, because it's cryptic, it's unaccessible, it's full of jargon, it's very difficult to approach and to understand, and it's not transparent in itself. The EU is famously um, difficult to navigate. Um, and this is something that we found throughout sort of all our investigation and all of the countries we looked into. Um, and it's especially interesting because the governing legal framework that is supposed to determine how this problem is solved is precisely an EU legal framework. Um, so the fact that this is so inscrutable and that's where the barrier lies, and yet this is the main sort of umbrella for how things should work um, is really interesting. And this is something that, again, we found over and over again. It's just everyone understands what's going on at the local and national level, but we get to the EU and then things become void and then it's not really clear. Um, yeah, so that was really interesting to find out actually. There are several directives, <laughs> and this is actually like I tried to uh, sum up the the whole directive uh, issue on the um, on 
in like one of our stories at the very beginning, uh, because I thought like, okay, you know, we have all of these, so this must be working. And um, when you look into those, like uh, water framework directive was, well, let's say that's like the main one. And it was labeled as, you know, the best or the most complete environmental directive that the EU has. Um, and I don't know if that's true because I have not compared them, um, but um, it definitely, it, you know, it seemed that like it, it has covered a lot of ground. Um, but what was interesting for me was, you know, if you measure, it measures the number of pollutants in the, in the EU waterways, right? But the list of pollutants is very much not exhaustive. And also there are some pollutants that are not in use anymore. So it's basically like, and some pollutants that are in use today are not being measured because it's so slow and because it takes time to add new pollutants to the list. But then you have also voluntarily measurements and those between the countries. And that's something that Luisa mentioned is like, that's like a chaos. And I've spoken to someone, um, those are collected by the European Environment Agency. And I spoke to someone at the agency and he said, <laughs> He said like, well, you know, um, sometimes we get this data from like one country and it's very good. It's like very complete. Um, but then, you know, like you, you have another country that doesn't send anything for like five years. Uh, and so you can't compare that. So you can't say like this country is doing much better than the other one. Uh, and that's, that's the whole issue. And that's something that I found like very challenging and also very frustrating. Like that was the most frustrating thing because like we weren't actually able to say like, this is like where we will go because we were looking for case studies and we hoped we will be actually able to choose the places we go to um, based on the data, but we were not able to say like, we will go there because this is the most polluted or part of Europe or like the, the worst river or like whatever. Um, yeah, so it, the story had a lot of layers and I think sometimes it's a bit challenging because you want to say to people, this is what's happening. But in this case, we need to say like, this is what's happening, but actually this is also happening. and. You know, it's sometimes um, talking too much about policy is not necessarily a very, doesn't make it for a very sexy read. Okay, thank you. Um, is the, uh, actually you already partly an answered the question, but do you think the current European regulation on pesticides, um, uh, is, it, is it enough to gu guarantee healthy tap water and, did agribusiness industries have an impact on it? And if so, what kind of impact do you think? Um, so we haven't worked on the pesticide regulation per se. So we didn't really look into like all the lobbying that's related. And I mean, it, it's happening because like others have covered it. So we sort of know, but um, there wasn't like, so we tried to actually analyze like how that legislation and how the use of pesticides, what sort of effect that would have on the waterways. Um, and in, in many ways, um, I mean, I don't know if it's, and that's the thing, like we, we don't necessarily, we can't really say like the legislation is not enough uh, because we, <laughs> it's very much also the, like how the legislation is reinforced or not. Um, I think what can be said is that there is definitely a lot of on the level of measurements and what is happening um, at that level. So that like it, it's not being monitor, monitored sufficiently so that we could say which areas are particularly problematic and why so. Basically data is missing. It's not good enough. At all the levels, yeah. At all levels, okay. And Lisa, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I, as you said, that is the sort of baseline um, level. And it is true, like as Yelena mentioned, um, we steered the investigation into uh, the areas that purposefully that hadn't been um, so investigated. <laughs> Um, in a deep way. Uh, so in that case, like the the regulation that you were mentioning, um, because there's been quite a lot of work uh, done around it, then we thought that, yeah, we wouldn't be able to beat what's being done, basically. Um, and there's already amazing contributions um, being written. 
but I, I think that is in any case sort of the baseline that we keep encountering over and over again. It's just the data quality. Um, it's just really hard to work with basically and to uh, what should be an instrument that um, throws clarity into the mix and helps us resolve um, the problems that we're encountering really actually is more of an obstacle, which is very far from ideal. The current situation in Spain is particularly complex just because there's so many layers, um, practical and political. Um, but just because there is, so it's, it's, a, it's a change in the regulation that depends on the local level, um, which is a conservative with the support of the far right. And then you have the national level, which is socialist left uh, government. So there's a clash there, it's election year. Um, and on top of it, you have the EU pressure, which um, I think is actually correct that they pressure, but um, they can't sanction, for instance, the local level, just the national level. Um, so there's many layers of difficulty in that process, which I think also makes it a much more heated debate because it's not only about the natural resources, but actually the power in balance and the democratic tools that we have to enforce the protection of um, valuable natural resources. Um, so it is quite complex, but it's really interesting in, like, to see, for instance, the process of um, infringement proceedings in action um, and how this should in a way help in this particular case and yet it's not effective in itself just because again the decision um, belongs to a level of power that infringement cannot reach um, and I think this is maybe something and, and the issue with infringement proceedings is something that we sort of opened in our investigation but we couldn't look into it in depth just because it's I mean it's it's a huge topic in itself beyond water of course uh, but it's terribly complex and I think it requires actually an investigation in itself um, which we're always encouraging people to do because we found it very interesting and we didn't have time ourselves but we we really think it's worth looking into um, but I, I see the similarities in the sense of we saw this very very sort of local and very concentrated problems in some very particular regions. Um, and at the same time, the sort of process that is supposed to protect um, the waters that we were seeing polluted, uh, which is again, infringement proceedings are not really being articulated in the way that they should, or it's, they're not being effective or they're not being transposed in a way um, that actually solves the problem. So there is an accountability gap there. Um, that is really important. And I do see the link in that particular way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could speak about the case in Spain for an hour in itself, um, which we won't uh, because it's too much, but it's, it's really, really complex. Um, and it goes to the core again of enforcement and how we're not managing to do it. I would like to finish with a bit of hope. Um, can you tell us, apart from the, um, the farm of the future that uh, in the Netherlands uh, that you mentioned in your uh, in investigation, another example of some initiative, maybe local initiative, that could give hope to uh, our listeners and, uh, and guests about the future of um, sustainable farming? or way to manage water that is also sustainable and scalable possibly. Yeah, there was a project and um, finally we didn't, I don't think I wrote about that, but um, there was a very interesting project that was um, um, basically pairing scientists with farmers in on like 14 different farms collaborated with local universities uh, in, in different countries. Uh, and there were actually two farms in the Netherlands. Um, and I talked to one of the farms, but what they basically tried to do, the whole project was about um, uh, the link between farming and water sustainability. So they both work on uh, water scarcity and uh, water pollution. And they were actually trying to figure out how very small modifications in the way 
um, these people are farming would impact waters, uh, water resources. And they have proven, and I don't have the figures because I, I like I hear about the figures and I, I tend to like forget them straight away. Um, but what was very interesting is that they worked on, and I like, like I really liked how how nerdy it was. So it was like, what what does it happen if we enlarge the buffer zone by this many meters? Or what does it happen if we grow these crops next to next to these crops and uh, you know, we do rotations every year or something like that. Um, and it was very interesting because it actually showed how much could be done with even these like small modifications. I, I, I don't think that those could work everywhere. I don't necessarily say that this is the only thing we need, but it was kind of encouraging to say like, even if we change the model of subsidies as we have them today, in order to include some of these um, uh, so some of these measures um, in different farms. And as I said, like farms were around Europe, so they really worked on local solutions and they, they like, they don't, um, they didn't look for one model fits all um, type of thing. Um, and I thought that was sort of, the, first of all, I thought it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting project. And then I thought that this actually could be scaled up. Um, and it was very practical, which I liked. Um, and apparently it, it has some value. Uh, it's not like the solution, but it could be a solution, I guess. Okay, thank you. And Luisa, do you have um, an example, another solution you'd like to highlight maybe apart from the I mean one? No, I, I I really like the the example picked by Jelena because it really does kind of feel like the future in a way, like this science and the, the agriculture pairing up together and like actually um, creating a model that is new and it's effective and it's sustainable. Um, so I find that really inspiring. Um, so I don't want to smudge that vision, but like I I will say that, um, yeah, we came across. Um, examples and practices that look like the solution are, are the solution and it's happening now. Uh, like the um, case in the Netherlands uh, that Gian Paolo was mentioning, we also, uh, like the, the Via Distrito in, the Via Distrito concept in Italy um, could count as well. So there are initiatives that are happening. I think just the, the issue that we encounter always is that the scale is small for the time being. And we need to find a way to scale it up and to support this rather than um, the, the harmful practices. But I do think there is innovation happening in the times of crisis. And there is a lot of creativity um, that is coming out of this sort of moment of panic uh, because the planet is changing and we don't really like it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really about scale, I think. But ideas are there um, and they're really, really nice to encounter. <laughs>